One of the world's most luxurious cruise liners headed out from New York Harbor to Liverpool in the midst of a global war. The nearly 2,000 people on the ship, though, were enjoying themselves on a warm and beautiful day out on the Atlantic when a German submarine fired a torpedo and struck the ship clean. Within just 20 minutes, the ship sank, leaving over 1,000 people dead and over 100 of them Americans who were still neutral in this war. The sinking of the ship raised tensions between America and Germany and helped to drive America into World War I. But why would Germany risk sinking a civilian ship with Americans on board? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. Okay, I know what you're thinking here, but this is not the Titanic. It's the Lusitania, but it was similar in style and shared a similar fate with the Titanic. But lest we go any further and get into any more spoilers, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, if the Lusitania was not shot down by German subs, would America have entered World War I? So keep your mind focused on the Lusitania and other factors that will be driving America to war. But first, life jackets on, because we got some history to swim through first. The RMS Lusitania launched as part of the British Cunard Line in 1906 and was constructed with the help of the British Admiralty or Navy to be potentially used in a time of war if necessary. Foreshadowing! Passenger cruise lines were a big business then, just as they are today, and the North Atlantic was where all the action was. In the late 1800s, a recently unified Germany was becoming a powerhouse in Europe and upsetting the balance of power there, and they offered the most elegant and luxurious experiences found across the frosty waters between America and Europe. Kaiser-class ocean liners were the BMW or Mercedes-Benz of the high seas. Can't beat German engineering. But the Brits were trying to. The Lusitania was designed to be the new gold standard. It housed a new massive engine, 68,000 horsepower that could average about 25 knots, and it was advertised as the Greyhound of the seas. There were ballrooms and halls, decadent restaurants, and it was decorated with massive frescoes and murals throughout. That speed, swagger, and style. The Lusitania became the world's largest passenger ship, but due to fierce competition, German cruisers were biting at her heels. And just as Germany and Britain were in battle for passenger liners, a single assassination would lead them both into battle in the Great War where the stakes were much higher. At the turn of the previous century, tensions across Europe were increasing and reaching a tipping point that led to the outbreak of World War I. Industrialization led to an arms race between the countries and militarism as countries stockpiled their militaries on land and sea with the latest and greatest weapons. More importantly, the rising new powers like Germany and Russia led to a complicated system of alliances to balance the power which was meant to avoid war, but it actually backfired once war was declared. Imperialism and the competition for land and treasure across the globe only raised the stakes for war because if you defeated your enemy, it also meant you could gain access to their overseas empire. And lastly, nationalism across the world led many to want to fight fiercely to defend their country with blood if necessary, and it would be soon. Now remembering the acronym MAINE can help you recall these underlying factors, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism, because on June 28, 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated with his wife by a Serbian nationalist wanting freedom for his people from Austria-Hungary. After the assassination of the Archduke, those underlining main factors all came crashing down in the most horrifying and frightful war the world had yet seen. It played out like this. Austria-Hungary attacked Serbia. Russia had an alliance with Serbia and came to her defense. Germany, aligned with Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia. Russia's ally France then declared war on Germany. And after Germany invaded France through neutral Belgium, Britain entered the war to honor their treaty with Belgium. In short, the dominoes fell frightfully quickly as Europe fell into total war with those militaries that, remember, had been getting stockpiled for decades. The major allied powers were made up of Britain, France, Russia, and later Italy. The central powers were dominated by Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And as war broke out, America, under President Wilson, quickly announced neutrality. Though America was much more closely aligned with the Allies, especially Britain, 
Most Americans hope to avoid what President Wilson called this vast, gruesome contest of systemized destruction. And that brings us to... Dad Jokes in History! Why did the Central Powers not trust a word that their enemies said? Lay it on me. Because they all lied. I... <laughs> it's so bad. Well, if you think you got a better one, I'd like to see it below. Back in America, leaders like Theodore Roosevelt called for America to begin readying for war, to join the Allies, and they formed the Preparedness Movement. They wanted to start readying the military in case war came, but most Americans still supported neutrality. However, if Americans were still neutral in war, they were never really neutral in trade. Once war broke out, American business interests and loans heavily favored the Allies, and in that way, we were never quite fully neutral. But the waters outside of Europe that American ships needed to cross were becoming increasingly dangerous, even for neutral nations. And whereas the Royal Navy was the unmatched queen of the high seas, a newly mastered technology, the submarine or U-boat, gave Germany a clear advantage. And as the war dragged on, they began targeting even neutral merchant ships. The Lusitania was the pride and crown jewel of Liverpool and part of a very profitable industry for the city. But despite the dangers of navigating through war zones, people still got their crews on surprisingly. And that's because there were actually rules in place for how to shoot down passenger liners that countries had agreed to follow even in war. The so-called cruiser rules required allowing the civilians of ships to depart safely before firing upon it. However, British merchant ships were ordered to ram and sink submarines that surfaced to enforce those cruiser rules. So the Germans were not fond of following them. On top of that, remember the Lusitania was subsidized by the British Admiralty and could be used during times of war. And Lucy had a secret compartment in the hull designed to store military cargo and was being used to carry armaments between America and Britain. Germany suspected this, and when the Lusitania landed in New York Harbor on April 24th, 1915, the German embassy in America took out 50 newspaper ads warning Americans not to travel into the waters of the North Atlantic. One ad with exceptional irony ran directly next to an ad for the Lusitania. You know, there should really be a word for when history and irony meet. Histirony. I like it. But the histirony was missed on the 139 Americans who boarded Lucy with about a thousand others, and they all left for a wonderful time on May 1st. The captain of the ship, Walter Schweiger, reassured the passengers of the safety of the vessel, its speed, and the protection that it would receive from the Royal Navy as it approached the war zone. Passengers enjoyed five days aboard their cruise. The weather was beautiful, the seas surprisingly calm. Music played, people danced, some played cards, and the third class passengers played shuffleboard on the deck. The most expensive room was occupied by one of the world's richest men, Alfred Vanderbilt, son of the railroad tycoon. All seemed well on the morning of May 7th as they were approaching the British Isles. The British Navy though contacted Captain Schweiger of the dangers of German submarines in the area. They sent the captain the location of the U-boats and ordered him to make evasive action, but the captain didn't have the correct codes to translate the message. The Lusitania was now heading towards Liverpool unescorted and unknowing into several German subs patrolling the waters. And at 2.10 in the afternoon, just 11 miles outside of the coast of Ireland, Ireland, a U-boat fired a single torpedo and it struck clean on the starboard bow. Engineers believed even if the Lusitania was struck, passengers would have five to six hours before the massive ship sunk. Plenty of time to get the passengers safely onto lifeboats, but the ship sank in just 18 minutes. Almost immediately after the strike from the torpedo, a second blast, probably from the boilers, ripped through the hull. Notice the severe list, the sharp angle starboard that the ship took. It sent people inside tumbling down staircases and hallways and scrambling with little time to escape. Inside the six floors, chaos ensued while the crew still directed people as best they could to safety. But only six of the 48 lifeboats launched successfully as others came crashing down and sank. Alfred Vanderbilt and others in his party worked frantically, trying to tie life jackets to baskets to hold infants afloat and out of the freezing waters. But time was against them. None of the infants nor Mr. Vanderbilt survived. In total, 1,198 people died in the waters off of the coast of Ireland, including 128 Americans. A mass grave was needed to bury the dead. 
By the following morning, news of the atrocity had spread around the globe. Americans and the British particularly were enraged. And though Germany apologized for the attack, they also felt justified as the Lusitania was carrying armaments. And submarine warfare soon proved to just be one of the major factors that had Americans mobilizing for war. In the election of 1916, Wilson was re-elected on the slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. This reflects that Americans by and large still wanted to avoid the conflict, but their preference for peace would be tested after the sinking of the Lusitania. Though Germany signed the Sussex Pledge promising not to attack merchant ships, they repeatedly broke that promise. Then in January of 1917, the British intercepted a secret cable known as the Zimmerman Note sent from Germany to Mexico that proposed an alliance between the countries and promising Mexico they would be able to reclaim Texas and the territories they lost in the Mexican-American War. Americans were outraged, and then a desperate Germany, hoping to win the war before America could get its boots on, resumed and increased its use of unrestricted submarine warfare in February of 1917. That was the final straw that sent President Wilson on April 2, 1917 to call on Congress to declare war. It was on. America, after three years, had thrown its hat in the ring. And how a wholly unprepared, isolated nation readied, fought, and helped to win this war will be the topic of our next three episodes, so tune in for that. So, did the Lusitania bring America into World War I? Well, considering that war was not declared for another two years, it seems hard to say that it was the central catalyst. But as a single event, it does stand alone in turning the hearts and minds of so many Americans into what was at stake in this war and whose side they were on, first with their hearts and later with their guns. Winston Churchill said, in spite of all its horror, we must regard the sinking of the Lusitania as an event most important and favorable to the Allies. The poor babies who perished in the ocean struck a blow at German power more deadly than could have been achieved by the sacrifice of 100,000 men. Indeed, the Lusitania marked a change in the circumstance of war that would continue to tremble the world in the 20th century, that civilian casualties became a byproduct of modern warfare. But we study history to learn from the mistakes of the past so we can pave a better way forward and not be victims of his tyranny. So thanks for daring to learn some today. This has been History for Humans. And hey, if you like what we do here, could you please click and show it? It just takes a second and it really helps me make more episodes in the future. And for teachers and homeschool parents, you can head over to my website, historyforhumans.com, and you can get access to lessons and resources that go with all of my episodes. And if you're doing the learning activity that's found on my website, hang out because I got instructions in just a sec. All right, we're gonna be mixing history with art, creativity, and the power of persuasion in today's lesson. For those artistic and creative students, get ready to shine. For those who are like myself and not the best artists, well, you can still certainly enjoy the process and just do your best. So there are two parts to this assignment. One is to do a reading to review America entering World War I, and then you're also gonna learn about the power of propaganda. You're gonna answer some quick questions from the reading, and this is gonna get you ready for part two, where you're gonna be creating a propaganda poster. And this is gonna be the fun part because you're gonna be able to create your own one that is focused on the Lusitania with the goal to get Americans to support the war effort in some way. And feel free to look up some awesome propaganda posters like these. And how's this one that you've probably all seen that came from World War I? Notice how it's simple but yet powerful, so it does not need to be complex. If you can, flex, and if not, just do your best. And I'll see you next time. Peace. <laughs>